Hi, I'm Madonna. I'm your worst nightmare. To rule the world. Why don't you show them what you do, honey? You've never had more fun with anyone else. People, people, we've got to move on to the next song. Right? Somewhere I'm sweet between. and I'm a bitch, you know what I mean? And that's always been the way it is. I'm, the, I'm a human being. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. Hi, this is Kevin Stay, and you're listening to MLVC, the Madonna podcast. And hey guys, I'm Tony, and anyone that says my show is neat has got to go. (laughs) Hi everybody, it's Stefan. Welcome to another episode of MLVC, the Madonna podcast, your place for all things Madonna Louise, Veronica Ciccone, as always. I'm joined with Tony, and as you heard, our esteemed pleasure of welcoming none other than Kevin Stay to the podcast today. Welcome everybody, Kevin. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me. I promise oh. it'll be quick and painless. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, how is uh, how is everything in LA during these crazy days? Uh, a little chaotic. Um, I think everyone is is starting to get the gravity of what's happening, and uh, yeah, it was a little um, scary down at the grocery store where you really couldn't keep social distancing because of the aisles being so small, and so everybody kept running into each other, and it felt like it felt like Pac-Man with everybody, you know, all these ghosts coming after yeah. you, and the fear in everyone's <laughs> eyes. It was, yeah, it was a lot. Yeah, it's been, a, I escaped New York uh, the other day. I'm now self-isolating in suburban Pennsylvania, my family's. Are you with your family? Wow. Yeah, I was... Honestly, I was having so much anxiety being in New York City, trapped in my one room studio. I was like, because I was afraid to go outside. I thought, you know what? I'm just, if, if I can leave, I can leave. And my dad picked me up and I'm going to ride it out in the suburbs. All right. I, I feel like I could be anywhere. It's like, you know what it felt like? It felt like suddenly I moved to like San Diego where there's not that much happening. <laughs> it's really pretty. It's really quiet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, San Diego is yeah. not a bad place to ride out. I love San. No, so. I almost moved to San Diego. Honestly, it's not a bad thing. Kevin, you're from Southern California originally, correct? I am. I was born in Los Angeles at the Hollywood Presbyterian, so I haven't gone very far. I'm still in Hollywood. Nope. <laughs> nice. Well, so for our listeners, in the unlikely event that you are not familiar with Kevin and his illustrious career, uh, just a little bit of background on Kevin. He came to fame working as a dance captain for Madonna's Blonde Ambition Tour. You might know Madonna. Uh, He's worked with no shortage of high-profile artists. Uh, The the long list includes none other than Michael Jackson, George Michael, David Bowie, Celine Dion, Rihanna, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Britney Spears. The list goes on and on and on. He's also done modeling, acting, singing. He's like a quadruple threat. Um, It's amazing how much you've done uh, in your life. It makes me feel like, what am I doing with myself? But uh, uh, I don't know. Tony, where where do we even kick off with Kevin? I mean, let's start... At the beginning, I mean, you were really new to dance when you were hired as the assistant choreographer for a Blonde Ambition tour, correct? Super, super new. I had only uh, done a couple productions back in Singapore at school, and I started taking dance class just like a year and a half uh, before I was on tour. So Mm. I I, I, I ate it up very quickly, but I really didn't have um, a ton of of background. Um, I... uh, Oops, sorry. There's a there's a strange sound in my thing. Sorry, that's I'm I'm experiencing a thunderstorm here in suburban oh. Pennsylvania. Oh, so. that's okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was maybe my computer. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I had never intended to dance, so I just took it for fun when I got to uh, USC because some English teacher told me that you know the dance was dance was not what I was doing, and that out yeah. in the real world there were real dancers. So I uh, took it upon myself to learn what real dance was. And, uh, yeah, just started working almost immediately. So you were hired as the assistant choreographer when Carol Armitage was the choreographer. Now, what was the, like the time span between her starting and then departing and then you working with Vince Patterson and then actually becoming one of the dancers, right? Yeah. Well, Carol, uh, held the auditions, um, mm-hmm. which were quite extensive with like six or seven different combos ultimately over the course of a few days. Um, and then a couple weeks later, I think because I think that was just before Christmas, uh, and then a couple weeks later is when we began 
uh, our rehearsals. And she was in rehearsals, but it was a very brief time in rehearsals with Carol. Um, right. It became very clear very early that even though she was wonderful and a, a sweet sweetheart and a good friend of Madonna's, she did not know how to wrangle um, New York Queens <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and really had a different process than the commercial world in Los Angeles, which is much more about here's what you're doing, show it to you, learn it, and then move on. She was mm-hmm. definitely more of a workshop choreographer, used to company work, which had weeks and weeks and months and months to create a piece. Um, and we only had, I think, six weeks total to do the 19 numbers. Oh, my God. It was yeah. only six weeks that you rehearsed? You complete In total, yes. From I'm still like, trying to learn those dances. It's been 30 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> six weeks. And the first two weeks were really occupied by the Vogue video and by doing a Nike commercial. Uh, that was only a day, but we were doing a Nike commercial with David Fincher that never got released. That's right, oh, Madonna's I'd Nike love sneaker. To see that, I would love to see that. <laughs> it was, a, it was. A, all I remember of that shoot was all of us sort of like lounging around and writhing on each other on a couch. <laughs> 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 it wasn't your typical Nike ad for sure. Right. <laughs> I would expect nothing less from a Madonna Nike ad. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, did you get to keep those sneakers that you had? No, no. Oh. I didn't even let us keep that. I know. Damn them. Damn but no, Nike. those are prototypes. We're going to have to have them back. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they still have a chance to make it up. Nike, if you hear this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Wait, so I'm just curious in terms of like, because I know that like nowadays Madonna, when she, like, she, when she was doing stuff for her Madame X tour, she was doing a bunch of workshopping where like they sort of like sit around with the dancers and the musicians and they like are concepting and coming up with stuff. And like that's sort of like when the show is starting to like take root or whatnot. When you started getting involved with Blonde Ambition, was it already decided that you were like, it was going to be in sections and these were the songs that were going to happen? And like, was all of that sort of already figured out? Oh, no, not at all. All that came came to light or got created once Vince Patterson was on, on the scene. Um, you know, I, I had, uh, they had let go of Carol Armitage before we shot the Vogue video, um, and brought in Vince Patterson really last minute. And he brought a completely different eye to the project. Um, which was definitely one of a director. I mean, I definitely like to think, you know, I don't know if he had the title of it, but he definitely acted as director because Mm -hmm. he's the one that brought, the concept of theater to the show and and broke it into sections on purpose uh, so that it had a cathartic sort of arc um, and actually had sense. So the songs actually made sense next to one another. Um, I think that was, that was all his doing. Um, so yeah, he, he came in and, uh, and, and gave it a life and a communication yeah. mm-hmm. and, a, and a message. Um, and she definitely saw that and ran with that. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've, I mean, I've heard many interviews either on the work podcast or other places that talk about like how long the rehearsal days were for all of you and, you know, like running the show like two times a day. And uh, I mean, to know that it was that short of a rehearsal time, that's, that's a lot of content to Mm -hmm. sort of pack in and learn and put together in a short amount of time. It was it was a lot, and and I was so grateful that Vince Vince kept me on because I was Carol's assistant. He didn't have to keep me. Right. I, I'd only met him twice before. Once I auditioned for him, and he he actually sent his assistant to tell me how much he loved me, but I was way mm. too young for the gig. And then the next time it was in a commercial, so it only worked within that one time. Um, and he embraced working with me and uh, and kept me in. Nice. Um, yeah, no, it was it was I was very grateful. He. Um, Oh my gosh! What was the start of that question? <laughs> um, We're just marveling at the the fact that like that that something as iconic and like sort of like concert defining of as Blonde Ambition was as a show was pulled together in such a short amount of time. Yeah, well, it's like Vince, lightning in a bottle, right? <laughs> Vince is very, this is always like a preparation king so he he brings in visuals and ideas very clearly he doesn't stop thinking about something until it's it's right you know he obsesses so when he got the gig i think it was just it was everything he thought about that entire period Mm -hmm. um did you did you know about vogue before you joined is that something that you had to like learn from you know just out of thin air 
I had to, I had to learn it from the boys. Yeah. From, uh, Jose and Lewis. I no better I, teachers, right? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> right. Exactly. When they, um, when they had the audition, they were like, you must know what Vogue is. And here's a voguing combination. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll do it. <laughs> and of course I, I was giving it the LA Paula Abdul spin. Cause that's all mm. we did in LA. It was yeah. like, hit, hit, hit. Right. And, um, <laughs> the best, the best advice I got was from Christopher Ciccone telling me to like, look more bored. Ooh. Oh, how funny. <laughs> Look more bored. I was like, oh, oh, there you go. That makes mm-hmm. sense. <laughs> what are some valuable lessons that you implement in your work today that you learned on that tour? Because I mean, there's got to be a million things, but like, what's something that, that just kind of hangs over you every time you walk into a new job and you're like, I learned this from, you know, that job I had in 1990. Um, I think, well, from Madonna, I definitely learned focus, um, diligence, preparation, um, and kind of giving a fuck while not giving a fuck. Like you give a fuck that it's going to be a good show and that you want to do the absolute best, but also not mm-hmm. giving a fuck. Like f- you have to have uh, trust in yourself and what you're doing enough that you stand by it no matter what. Yeah. Um, and from from Vince, I really learned, uh, you know, the that dance is not just movement. There's an opportunity in dance beyond that, which is communication and art. Um, and every job, every moment you're performing and working mm-hmm. and creating is an opportunity for that to say something. Um, and not all jobs appro- are approached like that from the beginning, but I always bring that to my jobs. And perhaps that's, that's why I, I work more is because I take it more than just, you know, it's not an, it's not an egotistical sort of, you know, trip it, or it's, and it's not just me having an athletic, you know, class or something. It's, it, I really take it as an art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Would you, I mean, is it fair to say that what Madonna and Vincent Patterson created, and I guess Christopher Ciccone as well with the Blonde Ambition Tour, has informed pretty much every pop show that has been staged since then? I mean, I definitely see it. And I see that influence. And, you know, every time I go to a concert, I'm like, wow, this is great. I wish Madonna were on stage, you know. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I suppose it's hard for me to, to really see that from the outside because in it, for me, being my first big major tour, that was all I knew. That was like, well, this is what it's supposed to be. Of course, Mm -hmm. it was a great paradigm to go from. Uh, But I hadn't really had a lot of experience with shows prior to that. So I didn't Mm -hmm. really, uh, I didn't know that not all shows had this thread in them. Uh, So for me looking later on now i look back and i'm like wow yeah i can't think of anything previously that that involved you know theatricality on this level and uh and it it certainly and even like groups of dancers like seven was a yeah. lot well seven was a yeah. lot back then now seven is very few <laughs> madonna right. brought what 30 30 people on the last tour. Yeah, i know <laughs> <laughs> it's like more 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 um you know i definitely think that uh you know, it was definitely the go-to for many artists who said, I want that. I want mm-hmm. something like that, you know, and cause it was, it was very inspirational. It's hard to see now looking back, uh, you think, Oh, that's a good show, but you don't realize its place in history where it came and it hadn't been seen before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even yeah. just the transformations of the stage. Yeah. Blonde oh, yeah. ambition was my very first, uh, Madonna show, but also my very first concert in life. Um, I was, 15 year old kid and I couldn't wait to go see her. And it's exactly what you said. I had no context for what was before that. So for me, once I saw Blonde Ambition, I thought, oh, this is just how concerts are. And (laughs) after that, I was like, I would rate every concert based off of Blonde Ambition. I'd be like, oh, well, this concert isn't good because it's not like Blonde Ambition. It wasn't, you know, like, why weren't they changing costumes? And why wasn't the set changing? (laughs) A life of disappointment (laughs) afterwards. (laughs) I mean, imagine my disappointment when I go see the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I'm like, they're wearing socks. They could just be wearing cone bras and everything would be great, you know? (laughs) Or they could just take off the socks and it might be good too. Yeah, yeah, that, that would have been really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, no, but I mean, like, it, it was just great to be able to sort of like see Blonde Ambition and have that be such a great, like, first touch. And then after that, it was nice to also see Madonna grow that format and change it and shape it and refine it. And have you seen, just uh, off, the, off topic, have you seen her other shows after that? Or have you just been busy and on, on the road and not able to catch her other shows? Um, well, I, always, I do always seem to miss it when it's in town. But I did see Drowned World. Um, mm-hmm. And I did see Madame X. 
And mm. I loved both of those. I actually really enjoyed Drowned World. It was a bit dark. Uh, yeah, I was yeah, sad I that, that. He, I was sad that she didn't play more hits and more more sort of upbeat stuff. Um, because I was hoping to, I don't know, I guess I wanted to like be more, you know, dancing in my seat kind of thing, but it was, it was mm-hmm. more of a, you know, theatrical art piece. Um, I thought Madame X was fantastic. I really liked how personable and connected to the audience she was and just really relating to people like she could see people. And so mm-hmm. it was just a, a different vibe for her and it felt like you got to see her in a way that was much closer to how we saw her. <laughs> and yeah, she, could, she could see people and she could also read them. Right. Stefan. Oh God. Yeah. I, don't, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had the fortune of seeing her multiple times in New York, but then I caught two shows of hers in Philadelphia where I'm originally from. And the second show in Philadelphia, I, a friend of mine, and I dressed up in like the outfit we put together, uh, self DIY God control outfits. So looking like <laughs> literally just like her in the very first outfit. And we got picked to be the, the little hot seat interview with, uh, giving her her beer. Oh. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, she was in a cranky <laughs> mood that night. Uh, the she was I, letting I, them have it. <laughs> yeah. I, I've said this many times before in the podcast, the Philadelphia crowd was drunk and belligerent to her and, she Ooh. gave it back to, I mean, look, she complimented our outfits. She told the crowd to shut the fuck up so we could answer our questions. And, but she was a little curt with us. Um, <laughs> sort of like, um, you know, like she just, yeah, she, she just wasn't the most pleasant Madonna. You know, like if you've seen her Instagram where like with Katy Perry or with uh, Brienne of Upt- Brienne of Tarth from yes. Game of Thrones, like she's really nice to them, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay. I, I I, but you know what? If if you're gonna get bitched out by anybody, let it be bitched out by Madonna. So. Exactly, Truly. that's what I say. Truly, I've come to appreciate more and more that terse, harsh side of her. I think before I used to be more sort of shocked sometimes when she would be very short with people. Uh, but I also realized that her time is super valuable and, mm-hmm. you know, she has a tendency now to like cut through the bullshit sometimes. And I actually appreciate that more and more as I age. <laughs> actually, as you bring that up, I just remember uh, in a lot of the footage from Truth or Dare, there's a lot of scenes where someone says something and you immediately put your hand to your mouth like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was so honestly shocked and surprised by everything. I was a very sort of not, I, yeah, no, I was very naive. I can't even like <laughs> mince, mince those words. I was very naive, um, very learned, but not uh, very street smart. And I had never even really heard people swearing before. So anytime mm-hmm. she would, she would drop the, you know, the F word and all these things like in everyday speech constantly. It just shocked the hell out of me because no, <laughs> who would, how could you possibly, uh, especially coming from an, Eng, an English school in Singapore, right. an English expat school. It's like, nobody said that. Like my big sort of breakdown one day was telling my history teacher, I don't give a fuck. And oh my God, the whole school was like, oh my God, Kevin said, I don't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> you know, so for, to hear that day in, day out from her, I was, I mean, I was just so up. Uh, well, not appalled, delighted, really, yeah. that somebody had that freedom. <laughs> and I, I, I've, I've searched to give myself that very same freedom ever since. So fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so were you, uh, you know, during the Blonde Ambition Tour, were you the youngest one or was Oliver younger than you? Uh, Ollie is just a little bit younger than me. And I think, mm-hmm. uh, I think Jose was the youngest. Oh, wow. If I recall. I think he, I mean, he, was, not, he, was, he was 19. I was 20. <laughs> Mm. yeah and carlton was like 25 i think and i remember thinking oh my god that's so old <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's so wise you know <laughs> he, oh my god he's he is so wise he, i don't know but, i don't know if we talked so much on that level back then but oh my mm-hmm. gosh wherever he's come from then to now he's a freaking monk dalai lama <laughs> <laughs> What was it like on the road for you guys? I mean, I, obviously, we you know we got a, a very small picture of what it was like via Truth or Dare, but I am obviously there was things that we weren't being shown and or footage that didn't land in the in the movie or whatnot. I mean, was it as fun as it looked? Because it looked like it was a lot of fun. Um, it was it was all of that and more. I mean, we really did have an absolute blast. We we bonded very quickly. I mean, if you could see. The, during the rehearsal period, before we really started shooting, I 
I idolized Jose and Lewis so much. I wanted to know all about them and understand them. And, and I would come visit them constantly. I was the only one with the car. So I would come visit them constantly at the, at the, um, uh, Mont Maison. Uh, and they would, you know, they would, they came to visit me at my tragic habitat. <laughs> 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 I, I lived at the corner of Hoover and Alvarado in Los Angeles next to a burned down church in a, hmm. in a Victorian house that was meant to be condemned with people shooting up in my basement. Anyways, oh. and they were at oh. the Malmaison. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm going to go hang out with them. <laughs> yeah. It, they, I mean, they were just, they were idols to me, really. You know, I, they were from a whole different world. People who actually, uh, they knew what they, they knew who they were and what they kind of stood for and they weren't afraid to stand up for it. And I mm-hmm. really, really, I wanted, I wanted that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I forgot what the beginning of the question was, but there you go. <laughs> no, uh, what, what was it? Okay, I like where all the answers are going. So. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, so you've worked with a bunch of, some, well, probably some of the biggest pop stars on the planet. You know, like, ha, ha, was it just every door was open to you after Blend Ambition? Was that sort of was <laughs> like, hit the ground I, can take, I can take any <laughs> job I want now? Um, I never thought of it like that because... It hit me more. It hit me in a different way when I got home. I know for Jose and Louis and Celine, when they got home to New York, they were like New York celebs out on the street. All their, you know, their house of extravaganza was like out of the way, out of the way. Let them in the club. That kind, that kind of. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I came home and realized that oh, I didn't save any money. A, <laughs> I had lots of clothes, great, but I had nowhere to live. <laughs> I had, you know, I had, I didn't, I didn't keep my my room at that crazy Victorian place. Um. And I didn't have a car. So I was like, okay, I'm back at square one, back at home. And also that now there's no paychecks continuing to come in. What do I do? So it was a big wake up call for me. Like, oh, I got to save, plan, figure it out and make it work. And I was back to the same auditions with the same people that I was at before I went on tour. Now, I know in retrospect that a lot of people had seen me on the show and Mm -hmm. would hire me or you know, favor me above others because they had already seen me perform. Um, but at the time it didn't, it didn't land like that for me. Nobody's telling you, Oh, I saw you in this and you're so great. And nobody says that because this is LA. Nobody even wants to yeah. tell you that they know you. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I, I think I definitely got a more favored position in auditions and things and jobs just because, because of my background with her, certainly. But also some jobs wouldn't hire me because of her. Like there was definitely... Once they the didn't want the association, right? Right. Like like Michael didn't take me on tour because it was... He could, I couldn't really be his dancer because I was already her dancer. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And then I think probably commercially there was, there was some, you know, some friction with brands that didn't necessarily want to back up the gay dancer side of things. Yeah. Um, I could be involved in a lot of stuff and be, and be in a lot of stuff, but they didn't want me as the main focus because it was like, Oh, well, I were also now, you know, approving his lifestyle or whatever that is. Oh, sure. Right. Corporate brands, not wanting to get behind a certain thing that they think might look bad for their brand. Exactly. Uh, I don't miss the early nineties in that respect. (laughs) (laughs) Me either. (laughs) What was it um, like? Saw, oh, oh go sorry. Ahead. Go, go, go ahead, Tony. No, no, no. I was just going to bring up Seiko Matsuda because I stan her <laughs> and I realized that you went on tour with her and that's amazing. But I just wanted to lead into um, working abroad. So you've worked abroad a lot and what kind of opportunities have like really inspired you to go work in another country and just, you know see what that's like wow well gosh you're the first person to bring up seiko matsuda (laughs) (laughs) i i really really loved seiko and i i I wish i could get in touch with her actually it's been so long i really i really enjoyed working with her and she was so good to me um i suppose the first time i went abroad was for her really um i was in japan for five months on tour with her as her lead guy um is that the tour where she's saying into the groove no no we didn't have been the groove Okay, it might have been like the one before that, but she yeah, does a really good cover of that. that. Yeah, she was. She treated me like gold, absolutely like gold, and it Aww. was the perfect moment because I had just escaped from a crazy ex boyfriend in Los Angeles who had sort of <laughs> had actually beaten down my door and you know oh, no. pun- punched no. me out and was like, oh jeez. Yeah, he was a hot mess. And and you're like, I'm going to Tokyo, chow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I moved to New York, and I was like, I'm out of here, and. Uh, that opportunity came up and I said, you know what, I'm going to, 
I'm going to take this moment. I'm free. I have no mm-hmm. connection to Los Angeles. I don't want to be there. I can be anywhere in the world that I want to be. And I have this job that was just handed to me. Uh, and I went there. I, I immediately started learning Japanese. I, oh, wow. I, I really, I, I had my, my, I made all these cassettes of like inspirational music and BB and CC wine ins. And I was singing along in the, in the <laughs> Japanese garden at the hotel and just like really taking this moment to like work on myself. It turns oh, out awesome. the whole time that I was there, my ex was in jail that whole time. He got put away and yeah, Roman, that's you. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> oh, it's almost like when Madonna went on tour for True Blue and Sean was in jail. Wow. Parallel. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've since made up. But um, I I found that that moment of choosing to go to Japan with Seiko really gave me this freedom of um, – realizing that I can work anywhere else in the world. I mean, mm-hmm. going to Singapore for school gave me this this sort of sense of, of being a world citizen, but going to Japan with Seiko really gave me a sense of, oh, I, it's not, I'm not just limited to Los Angeles. I can go anywhere and have a great time and learn yeah. and, and, and grow. Uh, and grow, exactly. And I also read you had a stint working in Italy. I think that's, is that where you started working on your own music? Yes, actually, um, it, Italy was a out of a little out of left field. Luca Tomasini invited me over there to do a TV show for a couple months um, as sort of the lead dancer next to Lorella Cucarini on Bona Please Domenica. tell everyone who Luca is in case they don't know. Luca Tomasini, uh-huh. for all of you Madonna fans, uh, <laughs> was was on the Girly Show. So he he was on the Girly Show. He's that fabulously sexy Italian that you mm-hmm. saw there. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, we know. <laughs> we all, he's we a work- huge star in Italy right now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like he's been creative director for X Factor and Amici and all these massive shows. I was actually just talking to him this morning. <laughs> oh no! Um, tell tell him we want to have him on the podcast next time you talk to him. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, Ciao, yeah. Luca. Ciao, yeah. Luca. <laughs> um, yeah, he uh, he invited me over there after we'd been working with Prince together for about a year and a half, and and uh, we got there and it was so successful in those couple months that they invited us to stay the rest of the year. And then we got offered a recording contract. Uh, we got offered for other shows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and people in Italy still remember me, which is very strange. 20 <laughs> no, something years later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it really, it made a huge impact on me uh, being over there. But also, well, you know what, you know, what being over there really taught me though, too, was the, the high price of fame. Mm-hmm. You know, that it's not necessarily something that I, that is worth giving your life for. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fun. The perks are great. I love the free clothes. I am not going to knock that <laughs> <laughs> the, the easy, the money to just show up and sign your name at a club. Like that's, that's kind of fabulous. Um, but at the same time you lose your privacy, you lose yeah. some sense of who you are. You lose some of your, you lose your time. Um, yeah. and it's not, always, that's not always worth it. So I try to take it with a grain of salt always now. Yeah. Well, so, um, if our listeners don't know, uh, yeah, you have a bit of a music career under your belt. Uh, you, your moniker, That Rogue Romeo, uh, mm-hmm. is uh, what you release your music under. And you have, I, I think, two full albums, correct? Yes, yes. Yes. So I, I had done a little bit of background research because I, I didn't know that you had released all these albums. And so I, I listened to um, Machine and Magic, and I felt like there's some really, really great songs on that album. And I I was getting hints of like George Michael with city of glass and wonderland. And then there was like, like a little bit of tears for fears with uh, right where we belong. And I just, I didn't know if like what, I mean, you've worked with so many different artists. What, like, were there some of the musical artists that you worked with that inspired you to, to write music or were there like people you haven't worked with that were inspiring your music or both? Um, well, thank you for listening for the music. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, I think, um, I mean, for, for me, always Prince has been my, my biggest inspiration. And not necessarily mm-hmm. that I need it to be ultra funky, but in the sense that he showed me that you don't have to stick to a genre and that you can right. craft your own sound and that it's okay. You can explore, um, that you can be adventurous. Uh, like his, his range was just so wide that I mm-hmm. it gave – it allowed me to give myself permission to just try things out and, and realize that it's more about what I'm trying to say rather than what I'm trying to commercially present. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in, <laughs> and in that sense, I, I suppose the album came across a little disjointed, but I feel like 
I just had things to say and that's how they needed to be said in those forms. Um, I think def I love tears for fears and I love George Michael. So I know mm -hmm. certainly in the background, those are always there. I'm, I'm a sing songy guy. So mm -hmm. definitely, definitely eighties pop is always, is always where I go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I actually kind of liked that it was not, I don't want to say not cohesive, but I liked that you sort of were sort of moving around from different sounds and different, ways of putting together a song which is what i sort of I, I liked about it you know like it was a little it wasn't so like super radio friendly type of you know like all american this is what you're going to hear on the radio type of thing but yeah i, I didn't want to pan i didn't want to pander to to radio formats yeah. i just wanted to make the songs be what they were going to be and it was it was an exploration too you know i'm not a professional musician on that level uh i just really had something i wanted to say and i got to you know, those, those, some of those songs are the very first songs that I got to really write top to bottom and be in the studio creating the tracks with everything. Um, you know, the, the music I had done earlier in Italy, they would give me the tracks and sort of melodies uh, with fake lyrics. And then I would write English lyrics in those melodies on top. Mm, oh, um, wow. And then the first time I really started doing my own music was uh, when I was on tour with Ricky Martin and Jamie King and Luca Tomasini were singing with me. And they, I would be in the studio creating these these tracks with with uh, Stefano Borzi over there, and uh, and then bring them in to do their parts. And that was the first time I ever even written a song, um, and it was so freeing mm -hmm. that that's. I realized that if I didn't actually eventually do my music and release something of my own, that it would be my life's biggest regret. Yeah. Like it, it was just, it's, a, it's like discovering a language or discovering you have an extra set of arms behind you. And you're like, Oh my God, I've never <laughs> used those before. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been all my life? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm a spider. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. And it, it was, it was very, uh, I, what I discovered writing the music was that once I had it, once I said it and it was out there, it let me move on mentally mm -hmm. uh, and free myself from those communications because they were said and it let me evolve. Yeah. yeah. You, I, I thought you have a beautiful singing voice. I was very surprised. Oh, thank you. Kevin, do you think it was like similar to when you realized you could dance or like, wow, I have these, this instrument that I didn't know I could play and here it is, you know? <laughs> um, well, I think with dance, it was, I was more surprised by the music stuff, actually. Oh, wow. I mean, the dance, I I was a gymnast early, so mm -hmm. I, I, I knew my body had facility and I knew oh, what I was capable of. So I think learning to dance and, and really sh showing off in that realm was more competitive than anything. It wasn't about oh, me okay. expressing myself. It was just more about you know, first of all, getting attention up with it mm -hmm. because I was you know young and it's kind of sexy and the kids loved it. And then it was like, sh you know, showing this English teacher, well, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, what do you, what do you, who are you to tell me that I don't, I can't mm -hmm. dance and that this isn't really what dance is. Well, you know, fuck you. I can do whatever the fuck I want. Yeah. And, uh, and then of course being in the, in the LA world around that, then again, being a naturally competitive person, I wanted to be the best. So I worked really yeah, hard. I, I can understand that because it's now, now I'm getting it that the LA dance community is absolutely the complete flip side of let's say new york conservatory dance companies ballet training and all that that i'm that's what i'm getting because it, it just sounds like two different worlds like it's oh just... absolutely they're, they're they're blending now with hip-hop mm -hmm. on both, both coasts and stuff but and people going back and forth and working on both coasts but right. la has always been commercially based and i think new york always like really prides itself in the sort of essence and purity of technique and of style mm -hmm. and over here it's like you got to do everything because one <laughs> one day you're a russian cossack and the next day you're a balinese spiritual mm -hmm. dancer and the next day you're doing hip-hop um dress like a candy cane like it's you never know what you're <laughs> gonna get uh on a daily basis so you have to kind of be everything well oh i God, have that's... to say you are still posting dance videos on your instagram and i look at you and i'm like god i i can't move that fast and you're older than i am and it's <laughs> I'm, I'm just in awe that you're so athletic and so props to you <laughs> well thank you it's the only way i keep in shape these days is if i try to work out like with weights 
I'm so in my head about what I have to do and what errands I need to accomplish that I, I it lasts about five minutes and then I get mm-hmm. ang- anxiety and I'm like, I got to get out of here and do my list of to do's. <laughs> so this is the perfect segue then. So you were talking about, you know, having to play different characters. And of course, in the 90s, you're a very recognizable face in a lot of now, I guess you could call them, you know, cult films, like I'm talking about Truth or Dare, Showgirls, Newsies, <laughs> Sister Act 2, <laughs> Back in the Habit. I have to say the whole title. Um, okay, you have to tell me something about Showgirls. What was that like? Because, I mean, it's one of my all-time favorite movies. I know a lot of people are just fervent in their fandom when it comes <laughs> to this film. But I I loved seeing you in this film, not only because I'd recognize you from working with Madonna, but you were like part of like a gay couple being depicted in a Hollywood film. Like you guys were even dancing in the end. I was like, wow, this is, I've never seen this before. You know, <laughs> on top of that, you had some of the best lines. <laughs> well, I mean, they were always trying to be shocking with, and so apparently at that point, a gay couple was still shocking. Um, yeah. And it was, you know, at the end, it was just a party and for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's surprising how many people come to me and go, oh, that scene where you were dancing at the end with your boyfriend. I was like, well, that was just me doing what we would naturally do because in the in the script were written as boyfriends. And I was like, well, we should be dancing together because we're boyfriends. Yeah. But it was surprising how many people locked onto that because we are in the background. It's not like there's a shot of us dancing, you know, um, because I, it just hadn't been represented like a normal no. da- couple dancing together lovingly. And it wasn't even acknowledged. It was like, this is normal. Everyone's here. Everyone's dancing, you know? And exactly. that's what I loved about it because <laughs> it was the first time that gay people were part of the scenery. I don't think that Paul Verhoeven even realized that we were there dancing as a couple right there. <laughs> I really, I think, because it was just us kind of just being there. And I don't yeah. know that he even like noticed it until, you know, I think it was, I think it was the gay community that noticed it, not him. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they were hungry um, for, they were hungry for, you know, gay people in cinema, you know, at that point it's, you know, I mean also, and we'll get to this in one second, but you were involved in Melrose place. And I always think about like how (laughs) Melrose place had that one moment where like, we thought the two gay characters were going to kiss on the show and then we're panning off and it goes out the window (laughs) and we, we don't see anything. And it's like, come on, you know, we just want, we don't even want tongue, just like two men kissing on a television show. And back then that was all we had, you know, but yeah. And the same thing with the birdcage, I went to see it in the theater and I was like, Oh my God, there are so many gay people in this movie and half of them were on the blonde (laughs) ambition tour. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. And most people don't, most people don't recognize me from birdcage until they know me or have met me or actually friends and then they realize they're watching the movie one day and like wait (laughs) wait take that wig off that's kevin (laughs) so do you get a lot of you know people i mean what do you get approached for the most would you say i mean i guess it's very neat it depends on who it is right it depends on who it is i mean definitely i mean now it's it it really has been madonna mostly because (laughs) of all the press with with her and with strike a pose coming out right. and all those press junkets and, 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 and interviews and things we've done for that. So it definitely now it's definitely more Madonna, but back in the day, I would get a lot of, a lot from star search and uh, Mo- Ooh, Mo- oh, Motown, yes. Motown live oddly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a whole different crowd, whole different crowd. Yeah. Um, def- definitely showgirls. There's a lot of very fervent showgirls fans and then newsies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Newsies. Oh my yeah. God. I saw that in the theater like five times. I just, I just could not get enough, you know, and and it wasn't because of Anne Margaret either. It was just, you know, it was like a big gay movie musical and it wasn't, you know what I mean? <laughs> a, mo- a, a movie filled with young hot boys. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be a gay classic. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, mean, I know Stefan and I were, uh, you know, in appropriate way. I don't mean it that yeah. way. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, we are, no, we're all Newsies fans. And then uh, Stefan and I were always talking about the Gap commercials. Those were so insane. They were oh, everywhere. So and good. I felt like you guys could jump out of the screen. It was so frenetic and energetic. It was great. They were so good to me. I really, I loved the Gap commercials and Carl Bird and Hillary and everybody. They were just, I mean, they were family after a while. It was like, mm-hmm. I mean, what, what are we doing this year? <laughs> <laughs> and how many um, Gap commercials were you in in total? I think it was like 40 or 50? No, oh, no, no, no. Um, between Gap and Old Navy, I did 12. Um, oh, okay. But Pepsi, Pepsi, I did like 30, I guess, I don't know, 25, something did you four- work with Vince Patterson on and Joe Pick on any of those Pepsi commercials? 
Oh yeah, tons, tons, tons. Mm-hmm. I think I did like like between like twelve and fourteen before they started ever started airing. Like oh, I did wow. so many so many commercials that never ran, um, mm-hmm. so many shoots for them, and then they would just they wouldn't use those that footage, or they would just drop it and do something else. Back in the day when commercial agencies had so much money, oh, right, yeah. right. Um, or I would get edited out of a commercial, and then it was after that that I started actually being in put into the cuts and edits of them. And I was like, Oh, mm-hmm. this is what commercial money is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, when I, when my first gap commercials aired, the khaki, a go, well, not the first one, I did the swing also, but khaki, khaki, a go, go and khaki country. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when they aired, uh, also the Pepsi with Aretha Franklin aired. they all debuted at the same time during the Oscars. And I was out of the country in Italy. So I didn't see any of it. But they were running. I was on TV like 24 hours a day, and I didn't even know. At one point, uh, I was in Italy, and I was worried about paying my rent back home. And uh, I called my roommate, and, he's, and I was like, do I have enough in my account to like pay for my rent? And he's like, bitch, you just have, I just have $40,000 tax in your account. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, okay, yay. <laughs> so speaking of keeping the clothes, did you get to keep any of the clothes from the Gap commercials? <laughs> I did, yeah. They gave us our clothes. Absolutely. All those khakis. All those khakis. I had all so many. All khakis. Yeah, all that old Navy <laughs> stuff had all that. So wait, did khaki a go-go? Is that sort of what got you into Austin Powers? Uh, did we do... Uh, when was Austin Powers? Was it be Austin Powers before or after that? I think Austin Powers was af- after. Yeah, actually, that's true. Which came first, Austin Powers or the khaki a go-go? It was, right at, it was like right at the same time. Yeah. Um, but I, I worked with Marguerite Derricks all the time. So. She choreographed Showgirls, correct? She choreographed Showgirls yeah. and uh, Austin Powers and Khaki a Go-Go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, gosh, I don't remember which came first at this point. Oh, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to get to that point where people tell me that I was in this music video or this performance. And I was like, really? Did I? Really? <laughs> <laughs> there was actually a whole Madonna performance that none of us remembered. None of us. In- we all, in uh, after we did the MTV Awards uh, performance, uh, the Vogue. With, a Vogue, you yeah. know, in Edwardian type of gear. We actually did a follow up, uh, a second performance of it for a charity. Apparently, none of us remember it. I think None. we asked Lewis about it too, and I think he just kind of glossed over. It. Yeah, well, no, it's it's the freakiest thing, and it really ha- it really has me thinking about like the mm-hmm. Mandela effect, you know, where it's like, did we yeah. just cross into an alternate universe? Because the only reason, like, we all denied it. All of us were like, no, that never happened until somebody showed us a picture, mm-hmm. and I was like, is that somebody? See, I've never, is that somebody I've never else even seen a photo. It? Yeah, I, I just remember I've always read about it. It's like it's like Madonna lore, you know, the AIDS Project, LA. Yeah. Both performance. It was either the night before or the night after. I heard it was the night, the oh, night after. Definitely, yeah. it would have been after because nobody saw it before. But mm-hmm. it, none of us remember it, and I certainly don't remember it. <laughs> and there's and no t- video of it. No, there's some weird, grainy little picture of it, and I thought I thought it was somebody else recreating what we did until I read an article about it. And then I also saw a picture of us, I guess, backstage or something during chatting. <laughs> Still zero recollection. Maybe it was your hologram. I mean, maybe they were just like <laughs> workshopping holograms back then. <laughs> I swear, so, Mandela effect. Speaking of Vogue, as we all know, Vogue, or maybe you don't remember or realize, yesterday Vogue celebrated its 30th anniversary of being released to the world. Um, that means when- Kevin was three when that was shot? I, I was two. I was two. That's why I was so baby faced. <laughs> He so I was wondering, like, when you were working on that video, did you think that the either the song or the video or the Blind Ambition tour in general would have such a lasting impression on people? You know, like when you when you first heard that song, did you think, wow, in 30 years, we're still going to be listening to this? Oh, no, not at all. It wasn't I mean, it wasn't my type of music at all. Uh, So the first time I heard it, I actually thought it was a remix of Keep It Together. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> like that's how like distant i was from sort of the pop dance music again i was only listening to really to prince and then a lot of alternative stuff like the cult and the cure and you know cocteau twins and you know all these other you know sort of off kilter things mm-hmm. and i really didn't know her music other than like her her earliest album that my first girlfriend was just obsessed with and looked like her and 
and then I knew her, I knew like a prayer because she had done love song with Prince. And right. That's the only reason why she was on my radar at that point, really. Right. Um, so yeah, when I heard the music, I didn't, it didn't really land with me at all. Um, I learned to like it, obviously I love it now. Um, but at the time I, I wasn't in tune with that. And you must have heard it 3,001 times. Oh my God, a bazillion, trillion, trillion <laughs> times. And of course, it always, it always helps to hear it on gigantic, massive speakers blaring. Like mm-hmm. any, any song you hear that's played at that level is going to be like, wow, I hear things I've never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> and that really does last with me. Like I, I have these visions, with this sort of sensory memory with her music now when i hear it i immediately go to the stage and they they live in a different space for me besides just listening right. to a song they 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 evoke an entire lifetime for me <laughs> <laughs> so um just to i want to go back to birdcage for a moment just because it's one of my all-time mm-hmm. favorite movies i loved i saw that in the theater and i was just it, it's a great comedy in general and mike nicholas is such a great director did you like get any FaceTime with robin williams or nathan lane at all during the filming yeah, definitely. We, it was it was not a short period of filming because they dropped and added us uh, early on. Uh, in with the union, there's with the union contracts, they can only drop and add you once before they keep you on contract till the end of the production. Um, mm. And they they kept us on for four and a half months. Wow. wow. Yeah. So let's just say it was the funnest summer of my life. <laughs> you guys were in Miami, correct? <laughs> no, we were actually in Los Angeles. So we got to stay oh, okay. home. Um, but we were just playing dress up every day because we were testing lights and testing outfits and testing makeup <laughs> and then testing different outfits and then running around and drag all over the set. There were a lot of very confused people on the rally uh, mm-hmm. set, sound stages. Um for four and a half months we were just playing and laughing and robin williams was was around a lot nathan wasn't wasn't there a lot at all i don't i don't really recall him seeing like twice um hank azaria was with us a lot uh and then mike because mike and vince patterson are very good friends Mm -hmm. um so he was around a lot uh and just just such a and some of your friends were also were also playing uh other drag queens, correct? Yes. Well, Louis Camacho, Louis Extravaganza uh-huh. was one. It was one. Um, so it was, and my roommate Dante Henderson. He was my roommate at the time. Um, those two were my probably my closest friends there. Um, mm. But yeah, Tony and every. But they was yeah. It was definitely family by the time we left. And Luca, Luca was in it as well. Oh, fun. I think yeah. I'm going to have to watch that again tonight. I haven't seen it in a very long time, but I'm feeling inspired suddenly. <laughs> yeah, it's such a, I love that movie. It's, I mean, a young Callista Flockhart. I think that was her first role before she mm-hmm. got Ally McBeal. And, yes. Um, I, yeah, I just, the, the chaos and how Mike Nichols is such a great director and he, like, he directs the shit out of that movie. And it's yeah. just, it's <laughs> such a perfect craft of storytelling. Is Who that was Christi- the choreographer for, for that movie? That was Vince Patterson. Oh, it was? Oh, thanks. Yeah, my whole life has been Vince Patterson, Kenny Ortega, Marguerite Derricks, Michael Peters. <laughs> it's been like Jamie King, like a lot of the same people over and over again. Oh, stay in thankfully. that lane. <laughs> <laughs> no, th- thankfully, <laughs> thankfully. You know what? I, I really enjoyed working with Michael, and I think it was the f- Mike, Mike Nichols, because I think the first it was the first time I realized that you don't have to stress over things. Like, you, mm. can, take, you can take your time. It was indulging at that moment you know to to have that much time for a a movie but he was so calm about everything every he he knew every scene would get shot everything would work out great um and i just i really latched onto that because i i I want to bring that to my work as well or i I aspire to that because i'm Mm -hmm. i'm a crazy weird perfectionist and i get i get like really high strung about things sometimes um and i when i do i look back uh at, at directors and people like Mike Nichols and think, Oh, I can be calm and this will yeah. work out and I can make this happen calmly without stressing other people out. Mm-hmm. Same with Peggy yeah. Holmes, same with Peggy Holmes, who was a Kenny Ortega's assistant for a long time and now directs um, Disney movies. Mm-hmm. She also, I've seen her manage people where in, in total contrast to say like Madonna or like other sort of big stars, she, she would just listen to what people said and she's like, okay, that's great. So let's, it was all about problem re- resolution and nothing yeah. about the stress of what's being said or, or, right. or how crazy it is. And it literally washed past her like water. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's brilliant. That's, that's mm-hmm. a, a genius skill. 
that's, yeah, it's, that's a, it's, it's, a it's one of those things to get people to do what where, you want. You know? If you can like expend your energy as opposed to like freaking out about the issue, like mm-hmm. conserve that energy towards solving the problem instead. Yeah. I always, I, I try to abide by that in life where it's like, okay, let's, you, there's no need for drama. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> let's, let everyone take a breath. Let's come down and let's use this time wisely. You know, like we can, we yeah. can make it work. It'll be fine. We'll fix yeah. it. That in sounds like you step in when you were telling me, um, you know, trying to counsel me while I was like trying to learn how to edit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Kevin, we, uh, Tony and I just decided to podcast. I mean, it's all, it's only, it hasn't even been a year yet. It's coming up that we decided to start this project and, we didn't know what we were doing and we just how hard could it be we're like yeah let's (laughs) let's just let's just podcast it'll be fun and there were many a night where we'd be like talking each other off a cliff just to be like if this isn't fun we're just gonna quit doing it you know like (laughs) it's it's over we're we're walking away from it um i'm glad we stuck i'm glad we stuck with it at a certain point in life you realize that fun and happiness is your own choice and your own responsibility. Yeah, so if it's not fun, that's our fault. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Stefan, let's talk a little bit about uh, Strike a Pose. Yes. So just a little, a little background, uh, Kevin. Both Tony and myself were in attendance at the Tribeca Film Festival premiere of Strike a Pose documentary. So we were there when you and all the boys were there as well. Um, <laughs> Tony and I did not know each other at the time, uh, but we were we were there to watch that film. And I think mm. I can speak on behalf of Tony that there was not a dry eye in the house watching that movie. Well, ours included. I mean, every time every time you see that movie, uh, it's it's hard for me to watch it actually because I I kind of yeah. lose it. I lose it. I lose it every time. Sue puts that rose down and oh. that's from that moment for the next 15 minutes, I'm usually just a, mm-hmm. a, a, a ugly cry, sobbing mess. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, but it is, it is cathartic. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad we've had that, that moment of resolution and, and peace and say it, goodbye to Gabriel. So, you know? Yeah. It's so cathartic and um, you know, yeah, I, I, I get emotional talking about it, but yeah, when we spoke with Lewis, he told us that, him and Jose kind of had to be talked into it, but how did you get involved with uh, the documentary? I mean, how were you reticent to get involved and relive this, or nah. was it you know another <laughs> opportunity to get together with your brother? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I mean you saw how I was, how quickly I responded online. I'm usually a big yes to everything, mm-hmm. just because I like to see opportunity in things, not in like yeah. I'm going to take advantage of this, but in the sense <laughs> that it's an opportunity to to grow and learn. Yeah. And why why would you say no to things that are potentially interesting or or positive? Um, I was concerned, of course, about again my lawsuit with Madonna. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't sure how much I could say regarding that, but I was like, you know what? It's not, this isn't about them. It's not about her. No, not about her. This is about us and our paths and our journey. And I had to take a bit of a leap of faith with them. Um, but they, they presented themselves in a very positive way. Um, and uh, I had to just, I had to just trust in them. Uh, and of course, watch what I said. You know, I'm not here to. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I never ever dish on Madonna. I never ever say anything bad about her because I have nothing bad to say. Maybe maybe some critiques, <laughs> maybe some things <laughs> I would do differently. But it's not. It has nothing to do about her. I have the mo- utmost respect and love for yeah. her, and always have. So and I even yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I told her that all during that process too. So I hope she's realized after you know 30 years that yeah. I still have nothing bad to say, and I still keep her secrets, and I still you know all that. So. Um, it was, uh, it was again, a a trust process and the thought of seeing the other, the book, the guys again was, was really enticing, Mm -hmm. uh, and and worth it. It was completely worth it. The second we saw each other, it was like no time had passed at all. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It was, I, I mean, as a Madonna fan, you know, being exposed to blonde ambition and then truth or dare, that was such a quintessential Madonna era, you know, like everyone always looks back on blonde, the blonde ambition era as such a definitive time in her career. And when she was sort of like at the like behemoth peak of Madonna. And I think, you know, like your participation in that era, it's sort of like, you're just part of the lore, you know, you're part of the the legacy and the legend of Madonna. And I, it was great to be able to see strike a pose because one of the biggest things, and I think this was why the directors wanted to do it, was 
what happened to them? Where did they go? Mm-hmm. You know, like, what are they doing? And it's like, yeah, I mean, we've been great. It's been great for you because you've been working um, in some high profile projects, maybe not so much with some of the other guys and, you know, the internet wasn't around for a long, long time. And so we didn't yeah. have like the Wikipedia background or the social media that we have today to sort of be like, where are those guys? What happened to them? And <laughs> I've never not seen Kevin stay. He's always on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so there's yeah, actually there's... a website. There's actually a website called Swifty spotting for a long time. That was just about finding me in got in jobs online on videos in TV, on TV and performances. <laughs> and they would just list, <laughs> Oh, I saw him here. <laughs> <laughs> Swifty was my newsies name. If there was a joke, no. Oh, how funny! But yeah, I mean, that's I. I loved that. You know, like we sort of got to sort of see you guys all grown up and where your lives yeah. were. And I'm. I'm. We told Lewis this. I loved how integral dance was to the movie. You know, like oh yeah, it wasn't just a movie about you know. And here's where they are today. But it was. <laughs> I thought. I thought it was beautiful and artful in its own right. You know, like it stands mm-hmm. alone as a documentary. You don't have to have seen Truth or Dare no. or the Blonde Ambition Tour in order to walk in and appreciate that movie. It has, I think, more heft and relevance if you have the background. But, you know, a newer Madonna fan who didn't live through that era would still love that movie, I think. It was one of the, honestly, it was one of the greatest gifts that I think all of us have ever been given and it was, it's because not just, oh, it's about us. Yay. But it was really mm-hmm. this, uh, it, it was, it was, first of all, telling our story and who doesn't want to be heard. First yeah. of yes. All. Um, especially dancers who are constantly seen and not heard. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was also this opportunity f- to realize that the attention that, that, and positivity or comments that we've received over all these years are not, weren't all just about her. Um, and I think it was so easy for us for so many years to dismiss everything um, as and anything positive that was said about us because, oh, it's about her. Um, and during the sort of promo tour with this with Strike a Pose, it just became very clear that even though obviously people are mega fans of Madonna, yay, um, as, are, as are we all, but it was more about the impact that we had and our visibility and who we were and just being ourselves that made an impact on others. And it land. It made the entire past twenty years, the narrative of the entire past twenty, thirty years, shift mm-hmm. into something really self affirming. That our work and our life and what we've done has been more than just you know shaking my ass on stage, and yeah. that <laughs> and that you've we've actually made an impact. Again, and who doesn't want that in an art, in a career, in a life? And it's bookended our careers for yeah. for many of us. Certainly for me, it was like, oh, I feel like that part of my life is resolved Mm -hmm. it's it's in a in a beautiful way not like closed and done but yeah but resolved and and seeing seeing those guys again i mean it just it was just reminded me of family and how important the people in our lives are uh not just our real family but our chosen family and the people that we go through things that no one else will ever understand or experience or you know, it's the shared experience that unites us. Yeah. And I feel like that's the biggest message of that film. Um, and you know, one thing I told Lewis when we spoke to him is that, uh, it was amazing to see Oliver's transformation to see how he grew up and the man that he's become. I mean, it, it's like, it's such an emotional part of the film and also Carlton too. He's, he's such a sentient and an emotional person. And, and yeah. I just love seeing all these different sides that you can't see when you're seeing people dance. Correct. Exactly. I mean, Oliver is just a big giant teddy bear. Like he's the original. He's the original straight gay ally. You know, <laughs> if we converted him in any way, it was just converting him into a big love bug. <laughs> and Carlton, I mean, he's just done the work. He's really mm-hmm. done the work on himself. Like he, there's, he's not backed down uh, from self discovery in any way. He's on this constant journey daily of. You know, how can he be of service to the universe and himself and the world and others? And how can he bring perspective and positivity at all times? And I mean, I just have, I don't have enough words to to describe how much I love him and every and all my boys. Oh yeah. yeah, All of them. Now, if you guys don't follow Carlton on Instagram, please do. I mean, it's like the message of hope 
shines through, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and you've also kept in touch with the girls. I know you did some work with uh, Donna Delory. I saw you uh, in a video of hers. Yeah, we had a blast. I got to, uh, I got to participate in that one. Uh, you can go check out her video online. Um, and, and Nikki, I don't get to see Nikki as much because she moved away. But I did. Cho- I choreographed her some early performances of hers with Jelly Bean after the after the tour ended. And oh my god, what's it going to be? I love that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had I had a blast with both of them. I mean, again, family. You know, you don't yeah. sometimes you don't realize who your family is until you see them again, and you realize, oh my gosh, my my childhood or my younger self lives in these people, and yeah. seeing them suddenly you realize who you were and where you mm-hmm. come from and where you are now. It's relevatory. Well, oddly enough, oh. a lot of us look at, you know, all of you guys and think the same thing. You know, it's like, oh, that's that place in time. And look at me now and look at them. And it's it's just, it's a beautiful comparison. I love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I, I we told Lewis, uh, you know, Truth or Dare was the first time that I ever saw two men kiss. And, you know, I was 15 years old, closeted gay kid in Northeast Philadelphia, sitting in a movie theater, watching these two guys kiss and there were strange feelings that were emanating in my body. And I, I didn't quite know what was going on, but I, I didn't. I didn't not like it. So, uh, yeah, I it mean, was. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the first time I kissed a guy, I had never seen a guy kiss a guy. Right. It was so strange and so awkward, and and like it, it was very challenging for me. And I, mm-hmm. I actually I apologized to the guy that I kissed because I was like I was so freaked out and. Um, <laughs> Because he asked, and then I was so freaked out. I was like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going on. It didn't feel right. <laughs> and, I, and actually, because of that, I thought, well, I must not be gay because it didn't feel right at all. But what I didn't realize at the time was that, oh, it's because he's a friend and I'm not attracted to him in that, right. way, in that, in that way. And it just felt like kissing my brother. And I was like, ooh, this is ooh. <laughs> <laughs> But that kept me questioning for, for a long time until I was on the tour, honestly. And that's when I was like, oh, I like guys. And I can be myself without trying i don't have to be anything anyone other than myself to to be gay yeah yeah that was a big realization for me because in the beginning I when, re- I, when i first met jose and lewis i thought oh if i'm gay does that mean i have to be like them mm. and they were so flamboyant i was like i don't know if i have that kind of courage to be crazy and flamboyant or if that's even me i guess and it wasn't until i'd been around the world and seen every type of gay and under the sun <laughs> <laughs> that i was like oh we're all over the place in every shape size form and and love and life yeah i can kind of relate to that i i i knew the day that i knew i was gay was may 4th 1990 when i saw blonde ambition in houston <laughs> <laughs> and i saw all this happening on stage in front of me and i was like oh i'm one of those guys and it's actually okay because they're up there and they're thriving and it's okay for me to be down here and not be ashamed of it, you know? So, you know, an early impression and, um, you know, I'm sure you hear that from a lot of people, but yeah, I mean, it was important to see you guys up there, you know, and to being yourselves. I hope that that night changed people's lives. It certainly changed mine. I don't, I didn't from while you were experiencing that, I was experiencing that I want to do this my whole life. I want to be yeah. here my whole life. I want to, I want this energy and this joy and be on stage like this for the rest of my life. That's why, honestly, that feeling is probably what's kept me going and dancing the rest of my life. That, that like that show, Houston, like yeah. c- coming from Japan, like Japan didn't do that for me. Japan was like everyone sitting in their seats and the, the ushers would make everybody sit down if they got too riled up and they were just clapping all politely. And Madonna was making, you know, making fun of everything. Like, oh, I thought that was a joke. So they really were very well behaved and quiet. <laughs> yeah, they had they had to be. They had to be. So it felt oh, like geez. we were doing like a sort of like a, a friends and family show with everybody sort uh-huh. of like industry sitting down quietly. It didn't feel like, you know, a crazy concert until mm-hmm. we got to Houston. Yeah. And that first when the lights went off. Oh my God! You know you were there. Oh, when the, I'm getting chills right now. <laughs> when, when the, I actually wrote about this. A lo, uh, when the lights went off and, and we couldn't hear anything for so mm-hmm. long, we couldn't start the show for so long because for ten minutes or whatever, five, seven minutes, whatever it was, they were that you guys were screaming and clapping so loud, we couldn't hear the music or the cues even with headsets on for, for them to cue the show. And at a certain point they just realized they had to just go and run the program. Yeah. So we didn't even hear the music or know anything was happening. We just saw the set going up. Oh, how fun. Because we yeah, couldn't, it, we couldn't hear the music. Yeah. So we just had to kind of guess when the, when the dance was going to start. 
Yeah, I, I'll never forget just hearing all that, like the you know the the gears and you know like the mechanics of mm-hmm. like you know before um, the drum beat start and dance and sing, get up and do your thing. And I was just like, how long is this going to keep going for? I'm freaking out. Where is she? What's going on? <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and we didn't know what the show looked like because we, you know, they, we had not seen photos or yeah, video or anything from Japan. And um, yeah, it, it's, it was incredible. It's, it's interesting to know that that sort of experience can never really happen again because, because of the information age and how pictures and video all get shared so easily like mm-hmm. you'll never quite have that same level of surprise and us as a as a company as a group as a group of dancers as friends as family like you, that will never happen either because we had no one else but each other we had no cell phones no email mm-hmm. no way right. no text no, no beepers nothing to reach out to anybody else so when we were on the road it was us in a microcosm and that's it yeah us on a bus us on a plane not a bad bubble not a bad bubble to be in though i gotta say (laughs) (laughs) it was amazing and they took such good care of us i i i wish more people had that same kind of experience now i know it's impossible Mm -hmm. but it would be it would be lovely to see more of that (laughs) um just a, a personal note kevin the day after the Tribeca Film Festival premiere of the Striker Pose documentary, I was walking in my neighborhood of Chelsea and I stopped at a light and you were next to me. And nope. I <laughs> I was so like, I was like awestruck and I was like, I have to say something because it's Kevin from Blonde Ambition. And so I was just like, I tapped you on the shoulder very timidly and I was like, I didn't want to bother you too much. So I was like, Kevin, I'm like, I just wanted to say I was at the movie last night. It was so wonderful. Thank you so much. And you were just like, oh, thank you. And then the light changed and we carried on. <laughs> Stephanie, you should have just said like, oh, where are you going? I'll walk with you. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. I, I'm not one of those crazy people on the streets. I like no. because I respect people and celebrities yeah. and like I see celebrities all the time in New York City. And, you know, like the other day, I before the pandemic craziness started, I passed by Julianne Moore for like the umpteenth time. I see her all the time in New York City. Um, but yeah, I just smile and nod and this and that. But yeah, I was like, for Kevin, I, I had to say something to you because I, and uh, you look very dapper, by the way, in person. You were very, de- very dressed up. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm glad you got me then and not now, because if you did that to me now, I'd be like, back off, motherfucker. <laughs> Six feet. Six feet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, craziness. Hey, Stefan, is it time for the lightning round? Yes. Yeah, so, Kevin, I <laughs> did not tell you that this was coming, but this is something that we do for every guest. Uh, it's my favorite it, part of the show. It's, oh, uh, it's, a, it's a lightning round. It's just three questions, but it's something that I – so it's just off the top of your head. You don't don't think too hard on it. Wherever you're at right now in in life, they are mm. they are Madonna related questions, so they should be very very easy to answer for you. Okay. Um, so first question: <laughs> other yes. than the other than the video that you're in, what is your favorite Madonna video? Uh, express yourself. Mm. Okay. Good. Uh, hey, I think that's another video people would watch and say, I'm definitely gay after watching this video. <laughs> David Fincher, like his lighting, the beauty yeah. of it. I'm such a Libra. Everything's about beauty, right? So yes. just the aesthetic of it. And it was just flawless, just flawlessly made. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I believe that that's where Vince Patterson taught Madonna how to grab her crotch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank God she's still doing that today. (laughs) Can't stop her. I mean, Um, Vince Patterson has a crotch grabbing thing. I mean, that's also kind of you know, mm -hmm. Michael Jackson did the same thing. Oh yeah. All right. Second question. Yeah. Uh, It can be from videos, photo shoots, tours, movies, whatever. What would be your favorite Madonna look? Oh. Oh god! Either Human Nature or the Super Bowl Vogue. Oh Ooh, yeah, good. Good, one, I, yeah. I, good. I like the contrast of both of those. Um, third question, and, and also a strong second for music video favorite is Human Nature. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah, love love that. Um, favorite item of Madonna memorabilia that you have? Oh gosh, favorite. Um, uh, I mean, maybe the most interesting is that I have one of our rehearsal, the music rehearsals, um, so you can hear her crafting the Like a Virgin part 
and sort of, and then also sort of like telling people to fuck off and <laughs> <laughs> this is bullshit. Blah, blah, blah. Like I kind of enjoy that. <laughs> um, oh, so you have like audio recording of that. I do. I have, oh, uh, nice. yeah. Cause I, I was given that so that we could kind of practice, uh, with real music and stuff. And then, gosh, I mean, I have, I do, mean, you still, I think do you that... still have, do you still have the tour jacket? I'm the only one that has their tour jacket. Good, the, because I get so mad at everybody. Like, oh, I don't know where it is. Excuse me? Yeah, yeah oh, no, Lewis, I, said I he, Lewis, Lewis says he has. He thinks he has it in a storage unit somewhere. Really? Thinks? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, have, <laughs> I have all of it. The only thing I don't have is my racer, the Gautier racer piece. Because oh, that was, oh, where's a party? That's yeah. my favorite. That, yeah, we all want, we seriously, we want, like, Gautier should come out of retirement yeah. and do, like, ready to wear like versions of that today <laughs> and i like people would buy them yeah, yeah lewis told us that there was also like a onesie version of the no all of the them were onesies stripes. all of ours all of were onesies. onesies yeah so they would stay inside our pants yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but yeah my, my, a- my crazy ex the one i told you about that went to jail he stole it mm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we can talk after, and I'll I'll steal it back. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I have one extra bonus question. Oh, um, okay. Is it true that Madonna can't afford real pearls? <laughs> <laughs> well, that should be obvious. <laughs> Does she want them? Is the question. <laughs> yeah. I love that moment in the film when you guys are just literally jumping on the bed. It's just hilarious. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you can see how much fun we had. Mm-hmm. and we we are still kind of the same we still have the same dynamics when you see us all together there's still mm-hmm. this like weird brotherhood where we're there's there's some angst and some some fighting and bitterness but also a lot of poking and prodding and 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 hilarious fun and sense of humor you know i'm looking forward to seeing us all together again at some point i'm not sure how soon that will be but um but i i i they're so important to my life and and have made such an impact for me uh they t- they taught me about family really yeah. more than any family i ever had cuz i didn't grow up with my brothers so these are literally my brothers yeah with uh strike a pose i mean we all love seeing this complete evolution of like you know brotherhood you know for lack of a better word and and we've loved following you know your career and also you know seeing seeing everything that you've done so we just appreciate your work and just want you to know that Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, no, and thank, it's thank nice you for to know that the... some people are paying attention here and there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Thank no, you. And, and... I mean, I didn't even bring up Charlie's Angels or Across the Universe because I've seen you in them too. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Before you go, any yes. any Melrose Place stories? Uh, <laughs> Melrose Place was such a fun, campy yeah, Tell me what you opera. did in Melrose Place because I don't remember. That. You, know, you wouldn't remember me. I was, I was in her – I was in um, – in the uh, in Vanessa's aerobics class um and so for me Uh, there's really nothing to do other than like no stories or memories other than god that was an early morning to get out to (laughs) magic magic mountain (laughs) because it was out (laughs) studios were out by magic mountain and it was so early in the morning that's really all i remember from that one oh so no like no uh no salacious like you weren't on set for slaps or fights or you didn't get to (laughs) you didn't didn't get to hang by the pool at melrose place or no i mean I, i got to see the set and everything but honestly i didn't even i don't think i even had a tv at that point uh so yeah i wasn't too deep in television culture uh Mm -hmm. and there was no vcr kind of stuff happening that much for at my place so yeah i was doing rather than watching and uh and that particular one i wish i had more to say about it but i do remember i do you know what in the back of my head i do remember going wait isn't that that gay character in this show in the same aerobics (laughs) class with me that's all was going through my head (laughs) Yeah, that, that was right. That was, because, that was a good show before the Kardashians. Yeah. We had Melrose Place. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. that was um, that was a, a time and place for sure. Um, yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us this week. Um, we loved having this time, and um, you've certainly taken our mind off of uh, what's going on out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of madness, and uh, yeah, stay safe, yeah. everybody, because it's going to get worse yeah. before it gets better. Yeah, but I know you have to get back to watching Tiger King on Netflix. So, <laughs> Tiger King and Big Mouth. Big Mouth is my favorite. <laughs> so, uh, have you finished? You, what? Where are you at at Tiger King right now? Oh, actually, we don't don't want to spoil it in case other people haven't watched it. But um, if you're not watching Tiger King, definitely I'm go just, watch Tiger King. I'm just stepping into episode six, 
Uh, oh, episode, the last one. Yeah. So episode five kind of just blew my mind. It was, and it was a bit hard to watch. So it's my, my ex, well, I won't say my ex, something similar happened with the, my ex. Uh, yeah, it's, it. it's okay. cr- I've yeah. never wanted to go to a dentist more after watching Tiger King. <laughs> I loved I loved Mario Diaz's uh, post the other day where he's like, "Is it wrong that I'm more attracted to him before he had his teeth done?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone posted a photo of him. And they're like, "Unlikely sex symbol?" Question mark. I'm like, "Oh, oh. Is, that, is that is that how how we're going crazy indoors?" <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for being on the show. I just want to like, Kevin um, say. Thanks for listening, all of you out there. Uh, you know, send us your comments. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at MLBC Podcast. Um, obviously, you can listen to us wherever podcasts are found. You know, um, oh, Spotify, oh, you know. Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Yeah, just look for us, and we'll be there. You know what yes. I'd like to say really quick is just you know to to all the Madonna fans who reach out to us and say thank you or what difference we've made in their lives. Um, it re- it really does make a difference for us and that we, all of us collectively, like absolutely appreciate and adore all of you, every comment, every word. It doesn't go unnoticed. It doesn't go unheard. Um, we don't always reply necessarily, but it every single one of you uh, has made a difference in our lives uh, and made us feel worthy and loved and uh, and part of a community. So thank all of you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kevin. I don't even know how I can go from there, you know? (laughs) Stefan, you want to say something before we go? No, I think Kevin said it all. (laughs) I think All right. Yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll we'll catch you next time. Yes. Stay safe, stay indoors, and we'll see you later. Bye, Kevin. Bye. Bye.